Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming back to this room. Uh, this is the time to start the uh, next session. Uh, the new session is uh, uh, FLARE CME uh, Space Weather. Uh, the first speaker is uh, uh, Subramanian Azirai. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Atre. I am a NASA postdoctoral fellow at Marshall Space Flight Center. And today I'd be talking about uh, FOXY sounding rocket flights and some of its interesting microflare observations. Uh, the work was carried out when I was at the uh, University of Minnesota, which was the PA organization for this uh, sounding rocket flight. Uh, uh, this is uh, my, the scientific team for FOXY. Uh, before I go into that, so I just have uh, idea about the sounding rocket. Sounding rocket program is the test bed for uh, to uh, test the future space instrumentation uh, and uh, keep it to the technology uh, readiness level, TRL, and it's a low cost. And uh, most of the sounding rockets, they reach an altitude of around 300 to 500 kilometers and then observe the target for about six to uh, seven minutes, and then it comes back. So FOXY is also uh, the same uh, way rocket, rocket program. So in this talk, I'll give a brief uh, overview of the instrumentation involved uh, in the FOXY uh, uh, mission and uh, discuss about the successful flight campaigns which we performed, uh, focusing on the microflare observations which we carried out during our second uh, flight. Uh, then I'll discuss in detail about the temperature response function for the FOXY instrument, and uh, uh, then the combined DEM analysis for one of our uh, flight observations for microflare to determine the amount of plasma present in the line of sight uh, as a function of temperature and uh, summarize the results. So X-ray diagnostics have been useful in understanding various questions, uh, uh, decades of observation from using uh, the workhorse, which is the RESI, Hard X-ray Observatory, there are many questions which still remain unanswered. Some of the questions are like how and where the particle acceleration occur, and what is the ro role of small-scale energy releases, uh, and how quiet is the sun in hard X-rays. To answer all these questions, we need to have instrumentation with better sensitivity, high dynamic range, and fine time resolution. So. Uh, here comes FOXY. FOXY stands for Focusing Optics X-ray Solar Imager. It is a sounding rocket experiment with all these collaborating institutions. It observes the sun in hard X-rays from 4 to 20 keV with a field of view roughly around a quarter of the sun. Um, uh, the main objective is to demonstrate the focusing optics technology optimized for solar observations. The, the science goal is basically to look for uh, uh, signatures of nano flares and small scale energy releases, uh, and uh, uh, also looking at quiet sun. Uh, Foxy had uh, three successful launch campaigns so far 2012, 14, and 18. This is the uh, successful uh, mission camp, uh, campaign for the third flight. Um, uh, Foxy uh, is the first solar dedicated hard X ray telescope using direct focusing optics. The concept is uh, shown here where the incident X rays, X ray photons, they uh, hit the uh, uh, ultra shined mirrors, which are X ray mirrors, at grazing angles and undergo double bounce reflection before reaching to the focal plane. So, the advantage of this uh, going for a direct focusing optics com compared to indirect focusing is to have uh, uh, the photons are collected in a very small spot, so you can have high signal to noise ratio, have better sensitivity. Also, the point spread function, which is shown here, falls steeply, which improves the dynamic range of your instrument. So, this is the cut view of uh, the sounding rocket experiment, FOXY, which has two. Uh, ends, one end where you have the telescope end, and uh, 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 the other end you have the focal plane module, which is the detector part. So the telescope end has uh, 
seven uh, uh, telescopes, which are electroformed replicated nickel, nickel optics provided by NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. They are Walter one shaped uh, X ray mirrors, and each one has uh, seven or 10 uh, X ray mirrors nested and co aligned with a uh, uh, with a resolution of uh, full width half max of five arc second. So the mirrors and the modules are well tested and calibrated at Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, and each telescope is uh, fitted with, uh, it's coupled with uh, a semiconductor detector on the focal plane, which is provided by our colleagues from Japan. So they are double-sided semiconductor strip detectors, which are made out of uh, silicon and cadmium telluride. Uh, uh, the, the focal length of these uh, telescopes are two meters, which is the separation between the optic and the detector focal plane module. So these detectors are read out by low power and low ASIC, uh, low, low noise ASICs dedicated for uh, these detectors. So uh, having seen the instrumentation, now uh, I'll give an overview of the successful uh, campaigns. FOXY-1 was first successfully launched in 2012 from White Science Missile Range in New Mexico. So this, is the, uh, this showed the first direct focusing, focused image of sun in hard x-rays, where you can have the comparison with the RESI uh, with FOXY, where the artifacts coming from the indirect imaging is uh, uh, fully uh, removed by using a direct focusing optics. So uh, the second flight was very interesting. We had uh, observed quiet sun. We have uh, observed quiet active region. And in fact, uh, one of the interesting results from uh, FOXY2 was the evidence of uh, nanoflare heated plasma from quiet active region, about 10 megakelvin, which gave this uh, publication. So also, we did uh, observe two microflares, which I'll be uh, discussing in detail in this presentation. So which are the microflares which we observed are an order of magnitude fainter than what has been observed from other observatories. So FOXY3, again, we had major upgrades to our instrument. We added a soft X-ray capability to FOXY3. We produced the first photon counting image of the sun in soft X-rays. We have heard about the instrument called Phoenix, which was tested uh, in, during this flight. This is an image from that. So uh, from now on, I'll be discussing in detail about the microflares observed during the second flight. So these observations were done uh, on 11th December 2014. Uh, two microflares were observed, and uh, the observation overall lasted for roughly six and a half minutes. The results are recently pub uh, accepted, and it's in press right now. So uh, the second flight was coordinated with various observatories, including uh, Hinode XRT, IRIS, and VLA. So the, uh, the, the movie shows here, the box is the field of view of FOXY. And you can see we maneuvered different regions on the sun. And uh, the microflares identified are uh, pointed out here. So it was very interesting that uh, the, the active regions which we saw, so this is, uh, during the similar time, we also found brightening in corresponding AIA channels. And this is the signature of uh, a proxy for high temperature, which is the IN18 map. Uh, showing the signature of high temperature plasma. So looking at these microflares, we performed imaging spectroscopy. These are all the images of those microflares. And uh, we performed isothermal spectroscopic uh, analysis to that, which gives you a temperature of around 10 megakelvin. And uh, when we calculate what is the equivalent ghost flare, so these are all sub-A class flares, which are A.1 and 0.5. So those two microflares you can see here. So what is shown in this plot is basically the RESI observed catalog uh, microflares and the GOES observed microflares are shown here. And the FOXY observed microflares are shown here, which clearly shows we have observed an order of magnitude fainter microflares than what has been observed in the past. So this is possible because of having a direct focusing optics. And, uh, as I mentioned, this was coordinated with multiple observatories. This gives a unique data set to have brightening observed in EUV until hard X-rays, which is a good amount of data to do a combined differential emission measure analysis to do uh, the amount of plasma present at different uh, temperatures. So this is the data summary available, so where you can clearly see FOXY observed these two active regions within the same field of view. So, to do a DEM analysis, first and foremost is the temperature response function. For AIA and XRT, we are familiar with this temperature response curve. Whereas for FOXY, the, in, the temperature response function tells the instrument's ability to detect plasma at different temperatures. 
So to do that, first you need to take the instrument response and then create synthetic, uh, 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 synthetic spectra, solar spectra at different isothermal temperatures, and then convolve them to get the temperature response. The takeaway from this plot is basically uh, uh, I, I, I want to caution, caution that uh, these points the, or the numbers cannot be directly compared as the pixel sizes are way different from different instruments. The takeaway is basically there is a good overlap in the temperature sensi sensitivity of these instruments, which would be useful to do uh, DEM analysis. The combined DEM analysis or the DEM analysis, the, the concept is uh, explained by this equation where we have the observed flux at different wavelengths, which is a function of the instrument's response as a function of wavelength and temperature to, to find the underlying DEM distribution, which is a poorly constrained uh, problem. So uh, we used a Hinode XRT DEM inversion technique, which uses a forward-fitting method to determine the DEM distribution for these microflares, which we observed. So the best DEM solution is shown in the solid black line, and the uh, uh, goodness of the fit is uh, shown as a part of the residuals here. So the, uh, the results, again, are looked in a different uh, 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 units here with the uh, emission measure, along with the loci curves. You can clearly see that it's already established that having AIA or XRT alone is not sufficient enough to constrain the amount of plasma above 5 megakelvin. There is a blind spot in the current instrumentation. So having a FOXY uh, uh, really helped to constrain the amount of plasma, especially the, the slope of the high temperature emission measure curve, which is clearly established here. So also, this flight, we had a unique opportunity to look at an active region when it was flaring and when it was quiet. So the quiescent active region, which was uh, the DEM was established by Shikawa et al. And we observed the same active region when it was flaring. So by subtracting this, we could exactly find what is the emission measure which is coming only from the microflare, the contribution from the microflare. So this clearly says that the background emission measure from R, it peaks of the active region peaks around 2 to 4 megakelvin. When there is a microflare, then the slope increases and uh, you have an excess above 5 megakelvin. So having determined the uh, DEM, so we estimated the temperature, uh, uh, the thermal energy released from these microflares, and compared it with the, uh, uh, the thermal energies calculated from isothermal approximation, which says that the DEM provides a better estimate of that. So in summary, uh, dedicated hard X-ray observations using direct focusing optics is very useful in understanding the flare heating and the energy releases from small scale events. Foxy coordinator observations are one of the few definitive measurements for the amount of plasma above 5 megakelvin. And uh, all these put together uh, says that the small scale energy release is important to consider for uh, coronal heating. So uh, with this, the next uh, generation space instrumentation, so needs direct focusing optics. I'll leave it there, and uh, I want to put this. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. OK, uh, comment and the question. So silicon goes from 4 to uh, 15 keV, after which the uh, efficiency falls off. That's the reason we tried with cadmium telluride, which goes up to 30 kilo electron volt. Another question? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. The, uh, Foxy, uh, observing uh, uh, duration is very short. Yes. Uh, did this uh, uh, Foxy to uh, capture the entire uh, profile of the mic this microflare? Yes, uh, not completely. So during some phases of the microflare, for example, microflare one was captured when it was decaying. Microflare two was captured when it was about to begin. So it was not a whole microflare. So it was some part of the microflare. Uh -huh. Yeah. OK. Any other question? If not, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Next speaker is uh, uh, Kim Yong Han san. Uh, the helium D3 and the 10 to 30 observation of uh, uh, C 5.4 flare on 2017, September 7.
Okay, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Yonan Kim uh, from KASI, uh, uh, which is the National Astronomy Observatory in South Korea. And today I will talk about uh, simultaneous observation, uh, simultaneous helium 1 D3 and 10 H30 observations of a cyclist player uh, in 2017 September. And uh, most collaborators uh, are Kashi colleagues, and uh, some from uh, some are from Big Bear Solar Observatory, and some from uh, Center for Solar Terrestrial Research in New Jersey Institute uh, of Technology, USA. Uh, first of all, I I want to uh, briefly introduce the uh, helium uh, 10A30 and D3 uh, spectral light. Uh, helium uh, 10A30 uh, or, uh, 10A30 arise from the transition between uh, uh, 2P uh, and 2S of neutral helium. Uh, there are two kinds of neutral helium, uh, para helium and also helium. Uh, or, uh, uh, called as uh, the singlet and uh, triplet neutral uh, neutral helium. The, uh, as according to the electron spin, and the uh, excitation mechanism of the the uh, the uh, 10H30, uh, two two excitation mechanism are possible, and the first one is collisional excitation uh, from the ground level. Uh, uh, singly to uh, triplet uh, neutral, uh, neutral uh, helium. And, uh, and the other one is the photoionization, uh, then uh, followed by the, the recombination. Uh, recombination can uh, make the, the triplet uh, population of triplet uh, helium. So, uh, and the 10 30 10 h 30 is uh, correspond to this one. And uh, 10 h 30 is sensitive to uh, dynamic phenomena and optically thin. And um, uh, the transition more higher level uh, can make the D3 uh, spectral line. And as for D3 uh, line, uh, transition uh, is between 2P and 3D, uh, like this. And the formation mechanism is similar to uh, helium 10 a 30 so uh, coronal uh, illumination uh, is required to uh, this formation. And the, the D3 optical thickness uh, is weaker. So the, on the solar disk, it is much easier to see uh, structures in 10 a 30 uh, than in D3. So uh, both lines are clearly seen in emission when observing a prime structures such as prominences and spicules. And uh, active region 12673 uh, on uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the location is uh, here, and uh, we, uh, our observing uh, region is uh, this part of this active region. And uh, the region is most player productive active region of cycle 24. Uh, uh, this active region uh, make uh, the several uh, several solar uh, uh, so many uh, solar players, including the, the several X class players. This is uh, the three day time period. That, uh, there are uh, some X class players and there are several M class players, and this is the. Time period is uh, just one day, and uh, 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 this day also the uh, one X class and uh, uh, several M class players. But unfortunately, uh, we we can observe uh, this time period, so uh, we cannot observe the major players. Just to, and in this talk, I will focus on the. Uh, uh, Twenty-one to twenty-two uh, UT. Uh, it includes the, the C5 class uh, player. And we, uh, we observe using uh, the Goody Solar Telescope, uh, 
with high, uh, high uh, spatial and uh, temporal resolution. And uh, uh, the, uh, as I said before, we, we could not observe major player, just we, we observed the cyclic players. And, uh, and uh, in this talk, I will introduce GSD TIO and D3 and 30 data. And uh, uh, we also compared uh, this observation with uh, SDO AIA and the HMI data. This is the 1.6 meter uh, Goody Solar Telescope at Big Bear Solar Observatory and observed the sunspot. And uh, the Korean solar physics community also uh, contributed uh, the uh, GST and uh, since 2004, uh, the CASI and the Seoul National University joined the GST construction and the peace development, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, most successful uh, post-focus post, post instrument. And we are joined the, the operation and the researches. Uh, several, uh, uh, in this meeting, several uh, presentations uh, uh, given by uh, Korean researchers uh, today and yesterday uh, based on uh, the GSD observations. And this is the, the uh, TIO uh, movie. On, uh, and uh, the, this, is a photo, this shows the photospheric uh, Level, and you can see the well-developed uh, sunspot, and the uh, umbra and penumbra, and uh, several uh, right bridges, and uh, uh, fine scale structures, uh, penumbra uh, filament and uh, uh, umbral dot, and so on. And but in this uh, uh, movie, uh, we we cannot see the, the some brightenings uh, regarding the player activity. And this is the, the uh, helium-1, D3 uh, movies. So uh, the, the, the appearance is, uh, is uh, uh, Sorry. This is the TIO, and uh, but the movie was not working. Sorry. And in this case, the the, the uh, appearance is quite similar with the the TIO. Uh, Movies, but but uh, sometimes we, we can see the some some uh, dark features, and uh, we can also see the the uh, play of lighting. But and sorry, and this is the uh, ten H thirty movies. So uh, you can see uh, so many features uh, uh, comparing with the D three uh, and the uh, TIO. Uh, the, you can see the, the flare brightening, and uh, uh, there are so many uh, jet-like features. And this is also, I think this is also the right bridge. And uh, uh, you can see the, some, some rope activities here. And for the, be uh, the better visual light, uh, visibility, uh, we rescaled the rescaled intensity of these images, so uh, you can see better uh, situations. The, uh, you can see that some player brightening here and some roof activity uh, along the, the right bridge, and there are several uh, several uh, jet-like structures. And uh, 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 
from these observations, we, we can find uh, several interesting features. Uh, first, the flare brightening uh, starts uh, from full point around uh, 21, 25 UT, and then followed by loop brightening uh, 2137 UT. And uh, the, this brightening um, are strong uh, in 1030, uh, then uh, D3 about uh, three times brighter than uh, the D3 brightening. And uh, we can see the several right bridges and uh, the, the uh, uh, different types, and uh, especially in the left sunspot, the thin, uh, thin uh, we can see the thin uh, right bridges. And uh, also we can find the, the loop activities uh, above the faint right bridge and uh, uh, this uh, right bridge uh, appeared bright, uh, bright in 1030 and dark in D3. Uh, I will show you later. And uh, all AIA images show the same bright loop structure as 1030. And we uh, can see also the, the running, uh, running penumbra waves in 1030 uh, line center images. And, uh, uh, they are weak in uh, tennis wings. And uh, as I said before, uh, in tennis images, uh, uh, there are several uh, uh, jet like structures. And among these uh, uh, interesting features, uh, the uh, special loop activities above the right bridge is quite uh, uh, interesting. So, uh, characteristics are. Uh, like this uh, bright in uh, 1030 and uh, dark in D3. And, uh, uh, but TIO has no corresponding features. And all uh, AIA images show the same bright loop. And, uh, uh, and so I, I, I will show the, the images uh, first. And uh, as I said before, uh, small loops, uh, we can see the, the small loops in many wavelengths. Uh, this is the uh, 1030 uh, and the uh, uh, AIA uh, uh, STO AIA images, and the 304 and the 171, 131. Uh, and uh, for the uh, D3 images, uh, I, I will show you the, the uh, D3 close up movies. Uh, you can see the, the thin right bridge here. And uh, can you see the, some, some loop structure here? Uh, please look uh, carefully, then, then you, can, <laughs> you can see the, the uh, relatively dark features. And uh, uh, in this case, also, we can see the uh, uh, flare brightening, but uh, this uh, movie has some problem. And this is the uh, uh, closer movie in uh, 1030. Uh, here is the, the uh, right bridge and the relatively bright uh, loop activity here. And uh, uh, it, this, this loop activity starts around the, the uh, 20, uh, 2105 UT. And then uh, uh, and uh, uh, around uh, 21, uh, 23 UT, and then followed by the, the uh, flare brightening around here. This is uh, the one two point of the, the uh, cyclist flare. So, and one more thing uh, I wanna uh, mention is the uh, magnetic polarity of the, the uh, around the round, uh, right bridge. Uh, this, this is the uh, uh, STO HMI and uh, uh, D3, D3 images. And uh, uh, we, we overlap then uh, both images then uh, the thin right bridge is uh, uh, correspond to the polarity inversion lines here. 
And then uh, the, the we made the simultaneous D3 and 1030 observation of a C-class player. And we, uh, we obtained the good data set. And uh, as, as I know, the, this is the unique and uh, uh, the important observation uh, with high res resolution. And uh, the, uh, the uh, roof activity of the sunspot right bridge is uh, interesting. And uh, roof eruption occur along the bright inversion line. So, uh, and precede the major brightening. And uh, uh, based on these observations, we, we suggest uh, the small, uh, small loop activities uh, in D3 and 10A30 above the sunspot light bridge is a mini miniature of two ribbon activities in the large scale player activity. And uh, uh, this may contribute to triggering the major brightening. So that's all. Thank you.
So I'm sorry for actually the, the, for traveling my uh, laptop. So uh, I'm Satoshi Inoue uh, of Nagoya University uh, today. So I'll talk about uh, uh, data constrained uh, Margaret hydrodynamic modeling of the solar eruption. So uh, as you know, uh, the solar um, eruptions are attractive uh, phenomena observed in the solar corona. So uh, since 2000, around 2000, uh, many three-dimensional uh, material modeling uh, have made a great effort to understand the uh, solar eruption. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, since 2006, uh, we can uh, get a high accurate observed photospheric magnetic field from space observation. So uh, then we had a chance to uh, take into account the photospheric magnetic field in the MHD uh, simulation. So, uh, recent data constrained MHD simulation, uh, especially so since 2013, uh, nonlinear force free field, except uh, nonlinear force free field or non force free field is used as an initial condition of the MHD uh, simulation. So, uh, these are uh, recent results uh, obtained from the data constrained, so data constrained MHD simulation. The publication is very, very new. So uh, today, so I want to uh, in introduce our uh, results uh, obtained from our data constrained image simulation, uh, focusing on the uh, solar eruption associated with our M6.6 flare observed uh, in the solar active region 11158. So uh, this uh, work was already published from the Nature Communication. So if you are interested in the, our, stu our study, so please uh, check uh, this paper. So uh, this active region uh, shows a very complicated magnetic structure, which is a typical quadrupole structure. And uh, this active region produces uh, one uh, X-class flare and one M-class flare. So we focus on the uh, M6.6 uh, flares. So this is a, a very nice uh, two ribbon uh, flares associated with our uh, M6.6 flare. And the uh, coronal mass ejection was also observed accompanied with our um, M6.6 flare. So uh, we want to uh, reproduce uh, this, uh, this, phen uh, this phenomena uh, using the uh, MHD uh, simulation. So uh, we first prepare the photospheric magnetic field 90 minutes before the M6.6 flare. And uh, uh, next, we extrapolate the nonlinear force free field. And uh, actually, the, uh, the detailed uh, process of the nonlinear force free field uh, is skipped. So, because uh, uh, we already ran uh, this uh, method uh, talked by the uh, Witland Sang and uh, Go Sang, uh, actually, that we already ran. So, uh, we performed the uh, nonlinear fo uh, non force free field extrapolation uh, using the uh, photospheric magnetic field before the M6.6 uh, flare. So uh, this is a nonlinear uh, force-free field, and the color of the, color of the field line corresponds to the value of the current density. So uh, inside the region, this is the inside region, so these field lines uh, have a strong current density. So uh, in this region, uh, free mag magnetic energy is accumulated to produce the solar flare. And this is a, a AIA a 171 channel, so we superimpose the field line on this image. So uh, this field line uh, fits image well. So uh, we used uh, this nonlinear force free field as an initial condition of the image simulation. But uh, we met uh, one, one problem because the nonlinear force free field is uh, quite stable. So uh, actually, the, uh, this nonlinear force free field cannot produce a solar eruption. So there are some disturbance or perturbation required to drive the eruption. So we assume the anomalous resistivity here as our uh, initial perturbation. So anomalous resistivity can enhance the reconnection between the two shared field lines. So this is a tether cutting reconnection scenario. So uh, tether cutting reconnection can make a, a long twisted line uh, like this. Uh, from the observational side, uh, for example, Ryu uh, 2012 and 2013 found the hard X-ray signal between the two shared field line, between the two shared field line and the foot point of the uh, foot point of the uh, field line. 
And uh, another uh, observational uh, paper, uh, Bam uh, Bambay Toro 2013, so she found, uh, she suggested the uh, Fourier triggering magnetic uh, mag magnetic structure, and the this location is uh, between the two shared field line. So these observations support the tether cutting recollection. So we just according to the uh, observational evidence. So uh, as you see, uh, this uh, long twisted line can enter the colored region. So this colored region is very important. So because we plot the uh, de uh, decay index profile in range from 1.3 to 1.5. So decay index is a, a very important proxy for the uh, torus instability. So this is a, uh, actually the magnetic flux slope and uh, overline field line in black. So uh, we consider the how to uh, keep the equilibrium of the magnetic flux slope. The magnetic flux slope uh, can uh, mag magnetic flux slope can take an equilibrium between the upward hoop force and the strapping force uh, by the surrounding magnetic field. If uh, this flux slope can reach uh, at a certain height, so uh, flux slope can become unstable to the torus instability. So uh, this simulation uh, done by uh, by myself and uh, Antonia Sabucheva. So flux slope at certain uh, flux slope can uh, reach at certain height. So flux slope can become unstable and uh, can make an eruption. And the decay index can tell us a uh, decay index can tell us a critical height uh, where the torus instability can be happen. So uh, according to the theoretical model. Uh, Decay index, thresh, uh, threshold of the decay index value is uh, 1.5, but uh, this value is strongly depending on the shape of the magnetic flux slope and the boundary condition, so uh, there are uh, some uh, wide range. Anyway, uh, so uh, this is a uh, uh, in this active region, so decay index profile is a very uh, Interesting. So, because uh, red color, uh, red color where the uh, magnetic flux slope can become more unstable, and the white region, uh, magnetic flux slope becomes stable to the torus instability. So, a stable region is sandwiched by the uh, red region, like this. So, uh, do you find dynamics of a magnetic flux slope in an, uh, in this situation? So, uh, very complicated uh, decay index profile. So uh, we don't know actually uh, what kind of dynamics show the, uh, this flux. So, so, so uh, therefore, we perform the uh, data driven, uh, data constraint image simulation. So this is the initial condition after the tether cutting reconnection, and the field line, uh, the color of the field line, uh, correspond to the vertical component of the uh, velocity Vz. So uh, this is a, a simulation result. So uh, flux slope uh, is continuously ascend, so not halt in the uh, stable region. Before going to the uh, detailed analysis, we, comp uh, we want to compare with the observations. So this is a, a two-ribbon flare. Uh, this is a two-ribbon flare uh, observed uh, from the Hinode. And uh, uh, classical, according to the classical uh, flare model, this two ribbon, uh, this, uh, this distribution of the two ribbon flare corresponds to the distribution of the reconnected field line, a uh, foot point of the reconnected field line during the solar flare. So we can uh, detect the uh, reconnected field line and we can map the foot point of the reconnected field line on the photosphere. So we might produce a, a, a simulated two ribbon flare. So uh, this is a, a result of the simulated two ribbon flare. Actually, the final uh, configuration is very similar to the observed one. So uh, from this result, uh, we can get the reliability for our simulation. So uh, this is a, a detailed analysis. So please uh, look at the uh, red line. So the red line shows a uh, temporal evolution of the uh, velocity of the magnetic flux slope. So uh, flux slope of first become unstable to the torus instability and the flux, uh, velocity increasing. But uh, when flux slope enters a stable region, the velocity is suddenly uh, suppressed. But after soon, uh, ve uh, velocity is suddenly accelerated, even in this region with a uh, where the uh, uh, flux slope is stable to the torus instability. 
So another te uh, this is another temporal evolution. So please look at the uh, red line. The red line is show a temporal evolution of the magnetic flux, uh, magnetic flux of the flux slope with highly twisted lines. So highly twisted line is a highly twisted line is increasing as the time passes. So why? Of course, because of the reconnection. So uh, torus instability is well established but without the reconnection. Under the uh, magnetic flux is perfectly conserved. But the sim uh, simulation can allow the reconnection. So with the reconnection and without reconnection is so much different for the dynamics. So uh, we, uh, we suspect the reconnection might be important for the solar eruption. So uh, we perform the, uh, we experiment one hypothetical uh, simulation. Uh, so that experiment is very simple. So we stop the velocity on the strong current density uh, formed under the flux slope. So this is a strong current density uh, formed under the flux slope. We stop the, uh, all of the velocity here. So we stop the inflow and the outflow. So this is a, uh, we can allow the reconnection, uh, standard eruption uh, can be achieved. So we stop the velocity on the uh, strong current density. So we uh, stop the reconnection. So time simulation time scale is quite the same. This is the result. So uh, actually the uh, flux slope cannot be uh, erupt. So uh, according to this result, uh, reconnection uh, is important for the uh, solar eruption. So this is a theoretical, a, a theoretical interpretation. So uh, this is a, a height profile of the decay index. So this red line shows the height profile of the decay index. Decay index once uh, over the 1.5 and the dec uh, less than uh, 1.5. But at certain height, uh, over the 1.5 again, OK? And uh, this uh, blue line shows the total current of the magnetic flux slope uh, uh, taking the equilibrium. So if uh, magnetic flux slope uh, takes a, a magnetic flux slope can take a, a this total uh, total current, magnetic flux slope can uh, take a equilibrium equilibrium at each height. So this is a, a equilibrium line of the magnetic flux slope. So we assume that a magnetic flux slope uh, is here. So this uh, this magnetic flux slope can take a equilibrium equilibrium. But uh, if some perturbation, uh, this, uh, this magnetic flux slope shift to the, uh, this uh, physical condition, so this physical, uh, this magnetic flux slope can uh, lose the equilibrium. So according to our result, uh, this uh, magnetic flux slope track, track the uh, line A, line A. So if uh, this magnetic flux slope uh, track line A, this line A meets the uh, equilibrium line. So uh, actually, uh, actually uh, this magnetic flux slope can take uh, equilibrium at the higher position. So, so actually, the uh, quite uh, same situation of the, uh, this situation uh, proposed by the uh, police and uh, Forbes uh, 1995. Uh, force and police, 1995. So once uh, flux slope loses the equilibrium, and uh, flux slope can show the eruption, but uh, at the higher position, flux slope can take our equilibrium again. And if we are, we can allow the reconnection. If we can allow the reconnection, according to our result, this uh, flux slope can take a line A dash, line A dash. So reconnection can uh, help the flux slope over the, this this hill. So this is a, a theoretical, uh, a theoretical interpretation. So uh, brief summary. So uh, decay index is, uh, of course, important, uh, important proxy for the torus instability of the solar eruption. But it determines only initial peak of the uh, eruption. So after the uh, destabilization of the magnetic flux slope, it experiences a nonlinear uh, effect. Therefore, the decay index profile is, is no longer meaningful. So as one of uh, nonlinear uh, positive feedback process, so negative uh, magnetic flux slope uh, could be accelerated due to the interaction of the reconnection and the instability. OK, so this is a, 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 fine, a brief result of the 11158. So we have uh, still, uh, still time. So uh, we, 
we go, uh, we want to, uh, I want to introduce uh, another active region. So this active region is very famous active region uh, 12693 uh, on September, uh, on 2017, uh, uh, September uh, 6. So this active region uh, is uh, very famous and very complicated so because uh, it produced the X9.3 class flare, so which is the largest solar flare uh, in the solar cycle 24. And uh, this uh, active region uh, produces successive flare, so first X2.2 flare uh, occurred occurred, and after soon X9.3 class flare occurred. So it produces successive X class flare. And uh, uh, during the flare, so please look at uh, this region. So uh, st negative uh, polarity strongly intrude in the uh, positive polarity. So during the uh, flare, so this intrusion so might be related to the uh, solar uh, successive solar flares. So uh, we perform the uh, uh, nonlinear force-free field extrapolation. Uh, and this is the result. So we can see the highly twisted lines uh, in the northern and the southern uh, direction. And uh, this is, uh, uh, we plot the uh, current density on the field line. So we can see the strong current density uh, around here. So uh, we put the uh, uh, nonlinear force free field in, no, we put the nonlinear force free field in the, our MHD uh, simulation code. So this is the result. So we can make, uh, we can successfully make a large scale eruption. And uh, uh, this is a ma erupting magnetic flux slope. This is a current sheet. This is a post flare loop. So this is a very similar to the standard flare model, CSHKP uh, model. But uh, uh, this movie cannot answer the following question. Uh, why and how does the eruption uh, take place? And uh, when does the X2.2 uh, X flare start? And uh, when does the X9.3 flare start? So uh, this is a detailed analysis. So this is a X2.2 flare, uh, 2.2 flare, and this is the initial brightening of the X2.2 flare. So we plot the uh, nonlinear force free. F uh, we trace the nonlinear force free field on the this brightening point on the one polarity. So this is a result. So our nonlinear uh, actually the, uh, in our nonlinear force free field the. A uh, foot point of the nonlinear force free field well, an well anchored well anchored on the uh, brightening point. So uh, we suspect this uh, field line uh, might produce the X2.2 flare. So this is a uh, uh, side view. The field line uh, color shows the current density. So, so we can see the strong current density uh, region is here. And uh, we, when we start the MHD simulation, uh, in this region, reconnection uh, start uh, in this region. So uh, this kind of the, uh, magnetic flux slope uh, can be formed. So uh, this, uh, this magnetic flux slope can be formed through the X2.2 uh, flare. And uh, um, actually, in this region, uh, magnetic pressure uh, is decreased. So another twisted line starts the reconnection uh, likely here. And, uh, uh, Actually, uh, under, the, uh, this, under the, this flux slope, uh, reconnection continuously occurred. Of course, this is uh, due to the uh, numerical effect. But uh, in practically, uh, negative polarity strongly intrude in the positive polarity. So this intrusion can enhance the magnetic reconnection. So finally, uh, magnetic, magnetic flux slope can enhance uh, like this, and uh, magnetic flux slope can enter the uh, colored region where the magnetic flux slope uh, becomes uh, unstable to the torus instability. So finally, uh, large scale eruption can be occurred like this. Okay, so uh, this is uh, during the eruption, and uh, this is a uh, bright, uh, strongly brightening, brightening uh, observed uh, during the X9.3 class flare. So we plot the uh, current density, we plot the current density, uh, volume rendering of the current density. So this current density, so well captures the uh, uh, strong uh, brightening region. So uh, our simulation uh, uh, might uh, produce uh, X2.2 flare and also uh, X9.3 class flare. Okay, uh, this is a skip.
Okay, so finally, uh, I want to show the ongoing uh, work and the future work. So uh, recently, uh, we, ex uh, we developed a new non-force-free extrapolation method. Actually, the, uh, we now uh, use a non-linear fo uh, non force-free field, but uh, uh, we recently uh, developed a uh, non-force-free non ex uh, extrapolation method. So we, uh, we seek the uh, solution in the magnetostatic uh, magnetostatic equation, so J cross B and uh, pressure gradient and uh, uh, gravity. So uh, the method is based on the uh, ma uh, ma MHD relaxation method. So uh, this, the advantage of our method, uh, advantage of our method is uh, to achieve the beta distribution. So in close to the photosphere, uh, we can achieve the high beta region, and most of uh, in the solar corona, uh, we can achieve the uh, low beta uh, distribution. So this is a, a reference field. Uh, we put the, uh, we prepare the simple magnet, uh, simple corona loop, but the pressure is inside. So uh, nonlinear force-free field extrapolation cannot reproduce this configuration like this. But uh, our new non-force-free field method completely reproduced this configuration. And on my side, so uh, we uh, recently uh, developed a new MHD code focusing on the multi-scale simulation of the solar eruption. So this code uh, implements a full MHD, uh, including the density, pressure, gravity. And uh, this code implements a nested grid system and also AMR. So because uh, we extend the uh, numerical region, but uh, we want to capture the uh, core, of the, um, core of the active region. So this is a test calculation, but the calculation is uh, well working. So we can trace a uh, flux slope uh, close to the uh, one solar radius. So we plan to extend more, uh, more region, and we want to uh, reproduce a coronal mass ejection, starting with a nonlinear force-free field or non-force-free field. Another uh, example of this uh, activism 12, uh, 12 uh, 371. So Professor Jaime Wang uh, suggested that uh, uh, suggests the uh, Fourier triggering magnetic flux in the very local uh, local region around here. But uh, actually, uh, we want to capture the, this kind of the local magnetic structure uh, and also uh, large scale magnetic flux slope. So we set the this kind of the magnetic, uh, this kind of the uh, numerical grid system. And we, ad we gave ad hoc uh, small emerging flux. So uh, this emerging flux can make uh, uh, this kind of highly magnetic twist line, and this highly twisted line can reconnect with other twisted line. Eventually, so large flux slope can be formed, and the uh, uh, current sheet uh, can be formed under the uh, flux slope. Okay, uh, summary, so data constrained MHD simulation is a powerful uh, tool to understand the physics of the uh, solar eruption and to capture the, uh, several observations. Advantage is to compare with the observation, but indirectly. So data inspired uh, simulation also uh, important to understand the basic, uh, phys basic physics of the uh, solar eruption. So data inspired and the data constrained also driven simulation should be com a complementary uh, relationship. And uh, we performed uh, data constrained MHD uh, simulation uh, for only few active regions. So different active regions show, uh, show the uh, different uh, flare scenarios. So uh, there are rich data from Hinode and the SDO, so I hope uh, that you enjoy uh, data constrained MHD simulation. So uh, that's all, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Oh, uh, you mean the actual the eruption process? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, actually, the, uh, this act, uh, in this act vision, uh, we require the anomalous resistivity uh, to drive the eruption. And uh, another act vision, uh, 12693, so uh, reconnection uh, starts the strongly intrude region. So. So this one. So this one. Now in, in this region, so the magnet, uh, gradient of the magnetic field is very strong. So uh, numerical resistivity automatically working here. And if we increase the resolution, probably we require the anomalous resistivity. In the first part of your talk, uh, where you said when the flux rope enters the torus regime, so and the subsequent magnetic reconnection leads to the eruptions in the nonlinear effects. But uh, the recent studies says that when the flux rope enters the torus regime, then also they, it may leads to confined event if it doesn't have the rotational motion of the flux rope. But have you included the rotational motion of the flux rope when the flux rope enters the torus regime and it suppresses the eruption? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, the, uh, you, you may ask the uh, rotational motion of the flux rope? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, actually, the, uh, I report, the, uh, yeah, I, I first published, uh, I published uh, one paper, actually, the, regarding to the, uh, this activation, and uh, we can find the uh, rotational motion of the uh, magnetic flux rope after the eruption. But uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we don't know the uh, specific reason why the flux rope uh, rotates after the eruption. And actually, uh, we suspect, uh, uh, we first suspect the kink mode instability, but uh, uh, we, ab uh, we calculate average magnetic twist. Uh, that magnetic twist uh, cannot satisfy the threshold of the kink mode instability. So we exclude, exclude the possibility of the kink instability. But uh, there are many reasons of the uh, rotation, uh, rotation uh, motion of the flux rope. So uh, we, uh, unfortunately, we don't know the uh, specific reason. But magnetic reconnection doesn't, uh, it just uh, accelerates the prominences, but it doesn't give the eruptions, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry? The magnetic reconnection, yeah. it just accelerates the prominences after the flux rope enters into the torus regime. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, but just it doesn't induce the eruption. Mm -hmm. Means it doesn't give to the eruption, right? Means it just uh, uh, reduces the uh, uh, tension of the overlying loops. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, you are saying that uh, magnetic reconnection is the, uh, means is the reason we, the flux rope leads to eruptions? Uh, yeah, actually, the magnetic, uh, magnetic reconnection uh, is important. So uh, I, we are checking the uh, role of the reconnection. So because uh, uh, if uh, reconnection takes place uh, between the shared field line, so uh, reconnection can make uh, uh, this kind of highly twisted line. So uh, this highly twisted line can enhance the hoop force of the flux rope. So uh, positive, positive feedback uh, induces uh, instability. And as you pointed out, so uh, of course, uh, tension both is decreasing magnetic flux rope. So both effect is important. Thank you. Uh, in the active region 1, 2, uh, 6, 7, 3, you haven't shown the global structure of the active region uh, of your nonlinear force field extrapolation. Oh, so sorry, I cannot catch it. Global structure of the active region. We haven't made a comparison of the uh, global structure of the active region with your NLFF field. Uh, okay. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 continue. Yeah, I'll be with you. Okay, so, so,
hello, hello everybody uh, good afternoon i am vemar reddy from university of positive physics uh, i will be talking about uh, time evolution of the magnetic helicity flux coming from the active region uh, during its evolution and some it has some with uh, some relevance to eruptive and non eruptive cases uh, so this is some background so if you see the um, if you see the any accuracy in evolution we have the mechanisms of the flux motions which are mostly the shearing and uh, uh, twisting motions uh, and on top of that we have flux um, emerges all through the convection zone into the surface onto the surface so these two mechanisms do have uh, we believe that they do change the magnetic evolution in the corona as well as on the photosphere so with this people do believe that magnetic energy storage into the magnetic structure uh, is only due to these kind of motions where the magnetic energy do builds into the magnetic structure and that 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 will exceed some critical value such as that magnetic eruptions do uh, happen so magnetic energy is simply a quantity scalar quantity but that don't have something about the a uh, chirality uh, that is magnetic twist or something else so to uh, to do, to deal with that kind of topological aspects of the magnetic field so magnetic helicity is one of the uh, quantity a physical quantity which measures the twist and shear and linking and uh, that has something to do with the magnetic complexity in the active region so so the basic idea of magnetic eruptions uh, the solar eruptions are based on the magnetic helicity uh, uh, do people do explain like this so here magnetic helicity is the one of, it has one one good property that is conservative property so in the in ideal cases that is fully conserved and uh, even resistive case also it is approximately conserved so this conservative property do helps the uh, do explains the magnetic eruptions this uh, major solar eruptions occurring on the sun so uh, b- for example uh, and one property is that magnetic helicity for twisted and sheared field is more than simply connected potential magnetic field so these two things suppose we have a flux rope in the form of twisted magnetic field in that case magnetic helicity for that structure is more than simply potential field so under those conditions if suppose the further st- twist is added in that case magnetic helicity is keep increasing in the volume of the uh, in the volume of the magnetic structure then there is some possibility that given a system the if you keep in, in, injecting the magnetic helicity then the system won't accommodate that entire helicity then there should some there should be, be, be way that you should expel you should throw away some of that so that way the cmes are are unavoidable so cmes do explain in the form of the magnetic helicity expulsion which is excessively stored in the magnetic structure so so magnetic helicity in the 3d volume so mostly enters in the case of sun in the realistic observations of the sun so the only way magnetic helicity enters into the solar atmosphere is through its surface okay as we in the previous slide also we see so it just uh, enters the surface and there is the open volume it can leave also Uh, so what we pose the questions are in terms of eruptions what kind of accuracy and evolution will generate the helicity and what kind of accuracy and evolution forms the flux ropes because they are they are important structures and does we find the threshold helicity for the flux rope eruption these two uh, three questions have important uh, importance in terms of magnetic eruptions so 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 this requires to answer these questions we require continuous uh, high resolution magnetic field observations uh, that is vector magnetic fields uh, on the act of the active region and, uh, and try to understand the helicity flux evolution that is the motivation of this uh, presentation okay so the magnetic flux ropes uh, again it's a simply a theoretical or modal modular uh, uh, nomenclature so in principle we see the structures on the sun in the form of filaments uh, if we see either h alpha or uh, it's a nearby wavelength in euv 304 angstrom unit uh, is a dark structure so surrounding structure if you see in the hotter channels you will see the sigmoids 
okay so these the, the this is the pre eruptive structure of a cme so these are all typically seen in every eruption so the uh, in the theoretical or modular point of view these structures are the these uh, uh, observations do regard as the flux groups so when i say flux groups in these structures please don't ask me that these are all magnetic field observations uh, so we do measure the magnetic helicity so magnetic helicity is defined at a dot b in the volume but that is that is the case for closed volume in the case of open volume which is the uh, realistic uh, on the sun so uh, that is um, slightly modified to the relative magnetic helicity which is by the berger and field that is in the form of uh, in this equation and the time uh, so this is what this equation tells is that the magnetic helicity in the that is relative magnetic helicity is with respect to some reference field for example ap is the potential vector potential of the potential magnetic field so in this is the simply reference field on top of that if you have a current carrying magnetic field then the the helicity difference of from this is the that 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 tells the uh, energy stored energy configuration excessive stored energy configuration so that that is something to do with uh, twisted or helical or kinked uh, structures of the magnetic field so this 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 uh, deformed uh, configuration is being captured how uh, in this uh, volume integral so of course uh, to do this to calculate this entire volume integral of the magnetic helicity we require the um, coronal magnetic field which are obviously not available because we have the observations at the surface only so in order to do that we require some kind we sort to some kind of models like potential field and non non linear force field extrapolations that we see yesterday stock by wheatland or today stock by young or uh, and previous stock just you uh, know uh, sans so uh, so that to, in this case uh, i may not do that in this presentation what i will do is that so i will take the time integral sorry time derivative of this equation under ideal conditions we end up with this equation where uh, one term is advection term and the term is shear term uh, so the similar way if you take the from the induction equation and some ma manipulations we will get the energy injection equation also so these two uh, calculating these two terms require the velocity that is normal component of velocity and transverse component of velocity as well as the uh, all three components of magnetic field of course vector potential of the magnetic potential uh, field is uh, calculated from the observations of magnetic field so uh, from this uh, uh, helicity flux injection this equation if we integrate over any time okay time interval we can get the helicity accumulation in the corona for example in the surface the helicity injection comes from the surface uh, suppose we are if you want to know the helicity accumulation in the coronal volume of the active region then it is simply to do with the integ time integral of this helicity injection over a given time interval so i uh, should i should i should mention something about so previously and the dated back to 2001 our professor che has done a preliminary work on uh, to calculate this term uh, i may not be able to cover a detailed account of uh, all the previous literature on these calculations except my results what i have done in the previous 2 uh, 3 years so here are the uh, calculations of the Uh, helicity injection uh, in three emerging active regions typically uh, so in the top panels of the three active regions uh, tells the the flux emerging uh, flux emergence while with respect to the while active region is emerging on the sun over a time scale of 4 to 5 days probably here it is there so if i calculate the helicity injection there are sign values changing in the in this active region the helicity is uh, Uh, negative in this case it is positive so in the in this active region that is changing over time from positive to psi uh, negative uh, uh, one more thing to tell that the helicity injection value of positive or negative preserves the chirality of magnetic field so here negative means it is left uh, left helical magnetic field the uh, in the entire active region it contains so in this case it is right helical magnetic field uh, 
So similarly, energy also we can calculate. So I, I am I will be more emphasize uh, on this LST term in this uh, presentation. So on the third case, so one thing I should mention that in these two cases where LST is uh, uh, one sign, either positive or negative, so over entire time evolution, then we see the CMEs. Uh, in this case also we see the CMEs. In this case we don't see the any CMEs from this active region uh, except the C-class flaring. So uh, this is some this is somewhat very crucial according to the theoretical basis what I told in the pre first slide that if the helicity is keep accumulating so it, it should go if once it exceeds some threshold value. So that means that continuous injection of magnetic helicity of one sign uh, there is a possibility that corona can uh, erupt at some point of time. That's why we see the CMEs in these two places. On this other hand, in this uh, third case, but that is not the case because there is a possibility that the helicity of one sign is getting nullified before it over accumulates in the corona of one sign. So, so, so in this case, the third case, what the actor is double one nine two eight. So the proposed scenario is like this, where the helicities keep changing over sign, uh, over the time evolution. So, uh, and we see the EV flux, enhanced EV flux after uh, uh, over the time uh, when it is going to change sign. Okay, so we propose that the magnetic helicity of the one sign over first time interval is going to get nullified by the time uh, other other helical magnetic injection, and that that gives rise to the active region structure reconfigure uh, over uh, over which uh, there is a possibility that the flaring and uh, activity can happen. That is uh, in the form of enhanced EV emission. So this this this. This, this study we further take up uh, while studying different different active regions. So uh, one one point is that in double one nine two eight the the magnetic structure is not highly twisted in the form of sigma del or any, anything. It is simply a potential kind of uh, structure. Uh, that that those kind of examples do encounter uh, if we see different active regions. Here are two cases I further show where time evolution is changing sign of the helicity uh, and we don't see the CMEs in these two active regions also. Uh, there is uh, one more uh, fun active region we further take up that is a successfully uh, erupting active region uh, 12371 which has been discussed in the previous uh, talk presentation also. So in the over the four days uh, for around a time span of a week or so, so we find four uh, CMEs with eruptions. Uh, here are the all eruptions which have uh, velocities exceeding 1000 kilometers uh, uh, velocity and the time uh, the LST uh, injection flux maps are like this. So if we see the magnetic structure, uh, for example any model like nonlinear force sphere or whatever, so we see the highly twisted core field with the uh, and the form of flux rope and the entire global structure of the active region is a sigmoidal kind of thing as we see earlier talk presentation also. So, uh, so, so in this active region the magnetic helicity the, uh, injection is predominantly dominated by the continuous sharing motions of this polarity with respect to this polarity. So this is the core, uh, core, uh, core part of the active region where the entire helicity is becoming accumulated. So the point we should tell that the in this case also a helicity is accumulated with only one sign in the negative negative sign and that, that gives rise to the 0.1 ton. Here I should mention one thing that the simple helicity accumulation over a time, inter a time interval uh, may not give you much information. Rather, I, I suggest to uh, um, normalize with the pi square. So HT by pi square has some uh, 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 intuitive information where if you normalize with the pi square value uh, of the LHC accumulation, then it is end up with having only the how much uh, how much, how many tons uh, that active region is being twisted. So in this case, it is twisted up to 0.1 tons in the entire uh, uh, global structure. So this is 
this is uh, in contrast to this the active region 1, 2, 1, 9, 2 is in contrast to the previous active region that is highly eruptive, which is non eruptive case, but it has large, um, uh, uh, large X class pairs. So, this active region, uh, if the same, if I calculate the same active region, the uh, LST injection, so the entire uh, 5, 6 days in the time interval will reach to only the 0 0.02 only. That is a factor of 10, it is smaller value. So uh, the global structure is twisted by a, a, by a factor of 10 less by uh, previous uh, the erupting active region. So this we uh, this this is the very interesting thing to compare that uh, we suggest that HD by pi square is the only one of the parameter to compare. Uh, to differentiate between the erupting and non-eruptive cases, because it contains, according to flux slope models, this uh, the uh, the flux slope models the flux slope models what it tells that the overlying field and the underlying field uh, are eruptive only in the case that either weak overlying field or strong flux slope. So this we suggest in this uh, case, uh, whenever to d differentiate uh, the eruptive and non-eruptive cases. So HT by phi square should be the useful parameter. Of course, we need to do much uh, studies. The last uh, slide. So in the same way, uh, the LST injection we compared in different different uh, active regions over different time evolution. So here the highly eruptive and uh, strong severe active region is 12163. That is heavily uh, the, a fast LST injection is being pumped from the active region compared to other active regions 1, 2, 3, 7, 1, double 1, 4, 2, 9, which are eruptive cases. They are here. Uh, but 1, 2, 1, 9, 2 is even very, very lesser value, uh, lesser, it is uh, coming very little uh, injection, uh, little less fast uh, injection. So this, uh, so so the different, uh, the thing what we made in this case to compare the LST evolution is that the here also the we have to normalize by pi square that has some 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 information to distinguish the active regions of different activity. So we further take up these uh, studies on around uh, some 38 active regions. Uh, if we find the similar results. Uh, so eight active regions without CMEs have DH by DT changing over sign and uh, these active regions have no clear sigma del structure also and uh, around uh, other active regions they they have predominant sign of helicity which which we find the cmes clearly so what we don't know in this uh, case is that we do not know the threshold of helicity content for a cme so uh, in this study i did not made any attempt to to know when the cme can occur what is the threshold value of the helicity content in the active region that I don't know, but that has to be further studied. So with this, I will uh, stop. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, first is the uh, uh, related to the evolution of helicity. So in the equation that you have shown earlier, uh, that uh, there you uh, uh, calculate the value of uh, uh, vector potential and uh, uh, magnetic field uh, at each time step, or I mean, right, how do right. you evolve the helicity? You don't have to evolve. This is everything is coming from observations. At okay. each time step, at every 12 minutes, I have vector magnetic field. Okay, so you will calculate the velocity uh, uh, with the magnetograms at a, uh, two time steps, T1 plus T1 plus delta T, the velocity you will get, then you can calculate the rest of the things immediately from the observations at that time. Okay, so you take the magnetic field from the observation only. Right, right. This is, everything is coming from observations, no model, nothing. Okay, so, I mean, uh, 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 I, I mean, you are calculating the volume helicity, right? No, 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 this is, DH by DT, the helicity injection with respect to time. Okay. So the equation. The okay, you mean from the bottom boundary? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I agree. And then uh, another question is that, uh, like you have uh, studied the evolution of H by phi square, 
did you try the other any other intensive quantity like HJ by H or HPJ by H? Uh, because they seem to perform better in the previous papers uh, that were like in recently in 2017. Uh, by what, do, what do you mean by HJ? The current helicity? Yes, current helicity. So, do you mean to say that HJ is coming from volume? Uh, I mean, uh, when you calculate in the whole volume. No, yeah. That requires a heavy computation. At every 12 minutes, we can't do model and do the same kind of uh, uh, evaluation and over, over a time scale of six days. Let's say computationally intensive. Okay, so that requires, and uh, of course, modeling also some artifacts uh, that uh, everybody knows that. Rather than doing all that, if you do the same kind of thing in the emerging active regions, then whatever the posed questions can be answered appropriately given some uh, margin. Uh, but I think it's possible to do it in less than 12 minutes. Of because, course. Yeah, by parallelizing. It can be course. possible, it can be possible. Okay. Uh, I'd like to suggest you to continue the discussion with the break time. Any other short question or comment? No? Okay, so let's thank the speaker and uh, all the speakers in this session. If you have not written your name for tomorrow's dinner, please do that. Uh, and. Uh, now we it's a longish break, so please spend time on posters. <laughs>